The smell was terrible. These are the words that I remember my mom and my aunties telling me about my grandmother's experience during World War II. You see, my grandmother was just 16 years old when the Japanese Imperial Army attacked Guam the day after the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 8, 1941. My grandmother was a young and attractive chamarita, a term used to describe women and girls on island. And my great grandparents, Nana and Tata, had a farm and the Japanese soldiers would often frequent there for food. Now at the time my great grandmother had heard of the atrocities that the Japanese soldiers were doing to the women and girls in an attempt to make my grandmother undesirable, my great grandmother would cover my grandmother from head to toe in chicken manure and mud, making her smell, making her dirty, making her unattractive. And many other women and girls on the island would also make themselves look sickly in an attempt to make themselves undesirable. And what were these atrocities that my great grandmother and so many others were afraid of? Slavery, sexual slavery. They, these women and girls were made to be comfort women for the Japanese soldiers. Now comfort women comes from the term, the Japanese word yenfu, which is a euphemism for prostitutes. Now these women and girls were forced into sexual slavery to be comfort women. And during the long 30 months of the Japanese occupied Guam, there were five known houses to house comfort women. Three in Haganya, which today is the island's capital, one in Inigua and one in Sasa near Piti. Initially, these women and girls were promised things like medicine and food and security, things that they desperately wanted for those that they love and for themselves. But these were lies and tricks. They were deceived. They didn't get these things and instead they were forced to have sex day after day after day. Now, today, you may be more familiar with the term known as human trafficking, which is the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of labor or commercial sex acts. Now, that word trafficking may be misleading, as it doesn't actually require the victim to be moved across borders. A victim can be trafficked out of their own home, or in this case, on an island. They do not come from a certain socioeconomic status. They're not a certain race, sex, religion. A victim, anyone can be a victim. And the same goes for traffickers and the same goes for buyers. Buyers do not come from a certain profession. Now, contrary to what some may think, victims cannot simply leave their situation without threats of their own safety or that of someone they care about, their loved ones, their children, without threats of getting themselves killed or their loved ones killed. To this day, historians debate on the number of comfort women during the war. There claims to be approximately 200,000 comfort women throughout the duration of the war in the Pacific. But what cannot be debated is that these women and girls suffered in silence. The survivors suffered in silence for decades because in this culture, it was shameful to have sex outside of marriage. And in many cultures, it's shameful to have sex outside of marriage. And the victims instead were looked down upon, were not believed, were not given the support that they should have been given. After the war, my grandmother did not speak about it very much. And many of our elders do not speak about the atrocities that happened during the war. But bits and pieces of their story paint a picture of survival and of suffering. Awareness is paramount. 
Many of my family and friends have cautioned me about being so open, about speaking so openly about human trafficking. But we do not know what we do not know. And it is important that we have these conversations. We have an opportunity to speak out for those who cannot speak for themselves. Now we lack data and numbers. Though many organizations are working to tackle this, it is very difficult because there are so many out there that go unreported. So many cases go unreported. So many victims remain silent. Now fast forward to 2009 when Guam established a law against human trafficking. And in 2011, when Sung Jo Cha, a bar owner on Guam, a woman in her 70s, was sentenced to life in prison for trafficking women and a girl. Now the headlines in the news, newspapers were speaking of the case. And as a young student, I felt called to action. I felt called to do something more than just read the paper. Not only was I wanting to educate myself, but I wanted to spread awareness because I was hearing so many people either not knowing what to do or not believing that something like this could really be happening on our small island. This was something that would happen overseas in another country. This is the problem that other countries have, not us. I wanted to debunk these myths. I wanted to not only educate myself, but others. And so I empowered around 40 university students from the University of Guam to make signs and to stand at the intersections of Marine Corps Drive, the main road on island. And our signs read, it's happening because we wanted the general public to ask us what is happening. And we wanted to tell them modern day slavery, human trafficking is happening. It exists and it's here on island. And we wanted to do even more by raising funds, a survivor's fund. And so we hand stitched ribbons like the one I'm wearing now with blue with the color for the color of human trafficking awareness. And we sold these ribbons by donation. In just a couple of weeks, we raised around $2,000 to start a fund for survivors. But we wanted to make an even bigger impact. And so we held a forum. We planned for weeks and broadcasted it and let folks know about it and opened it to the general public and held it on campus at the University of Guam. It was a forum on human trafficking with a special emphasis on sex trafficking in Guam and Micronesia. And we wanted the world to know that yes, it is here too. And we wanted the general public to know that there was something that we could do, that we could take part in this fight against human trafficking. Now, Many people came up to me after the forum asking me what they could do to be part of this fight. On the panel, we had representatives from the U.S. Attorney's Office, the Guam Department of Labor. We had uh, Guam Superior Court judges. We had politicians, local senators. We had local professors, representatives from nonprofits, in attendance, local law enforcement. And we wanted them to share bits and pieces of their perspectives about what we could do, how we could be part of the fight against human trafficking, and even more so, what is it? What is happening? How is it here in our borders? I want to share with you that you do not need to be of a certain profession to be part of this fight against human trafficking. You do not need to be a lawyer, a law enforcement officer, a social worker. You do not need to be working at a local nonprofit against human trafficking to be part of this fight. I am a soldier in the United States Army and I have devoted nearly 10 years of my own time volunteering for organizations that are part of this fight. I've taken the time to not only spread awareness 
but to even conduct classes, not just for the military personnel, but also the local community, neighborhood night watches, churches. I've even gotten in touch with local politicians, state leaders, local law enforcement, to ask them, what could I do? How could I support their efforts? I ask because I want them to be able to share. They all have a story of the cases that they're working and more importantly, bringing survivors to the table and hearing what they have to say because it is so important that the survivors' voices are heard and that they do not remain suffering in silence as the comfort women did on Guam, World War II. There is something that we can all do to be part of this fight. Now, Guam is an island approximately 212 square miles with roughly 150,000 people. Guam may be a small island, but we can make a big impact and be at the forefront in this fight against human trafficking, against sex trafficking, against labor trafficking. There is more that we can do. And I encourage all of you to learn about local laws and policies in your local communities. Conduct training, coordinate, participate, bring survivors, bring a local law enforcement and speak to your local leaders about what they can do to improve policy and legislation and educate yourselves, your families, your friends, your neighborhood. Because human trafficking is everywhere and it can happen anywhere and it can happen to any of us. So I encourage and empower all of you to join me in this fight to stop the demand for sex, to stop the demand for sex. You can find out more from the Department of Homeland Security, the Guam Coalition Against Sexual Assault and Family Violence, the U.S. Attorney's Office, and human trafficking task forces that exist across the country and around the world, Shared Hope International, Polaris, Operation Underground Railroad, and so many other organizations that are out there in this fight. Be part of this fight with me. Suzu Usmasi, thank you.